Hello and welcome to Imp's WWE Adventures podcast on the Social Suplex Podcast Network. Help the network out by leaving us a five-star review, give a donation directly through with Circle, and become one of the amazing community by joining the Social Suplex Discord. Link is in the description. Listen to the other top-notch shows here on the Social Suplex Podcast Network, One Nation Radio, Keeping It Strong Style, All Things Elite, Wrestling Up with Chris Things, Trish and Sarah, Total Talk, and Sam Brown's AEW Match Guide. Social Suplex has official merch. Thank you to Chopped Tees. Free shipping on every product to almost everywhere in the world. No taxes to pay at the checkout. International customers are shopping their own currency at fixed prices. Uh, quality guarantee. A safe and secure checkout. A uh, really high quality. With every, we're so happy with seeing every single thing that we've got. Temperature's dropping over here in the UK. I'm wearing my hoodie a little bit too much. Really, I just I feel nice and cosy in it. <laughs> so thank you, Dicky, <laughs> for doing that. Who's a huge shout out to Dicky for all the work that he's done with Chops Tees. So if you want to go to chops-tees.com for every single social suplex show, including social suplex uh, merchandise itself for the brand as well. So yes, go over there and check that out. My name is Matt Mayer, aka M, and this is your quick look back at the WWE week that was 30 minutes. <sighs> Three minutes, we just got to get through, guys. <laughs> we just got to get through. I feel like um, I'm feeling it in my... In, I don't know if it's just me, because of course I can sense it. You're only worth critic and that lot. But I can just feel like my tone is just off. <laughs> it's just... I've been like kind of just knocked off kilter. Because um, I, I know what I'm kind of like with the way that I do these shows. And I'll go through it. I keep it relatively lighthearted. I'll be... I'll do my little giggles and things, which are really useful for the edits. <laughs> I will say that. My, my little giggles, like that one there. If I don't like what I say afterwards, I can use the giggle to mask the cut. Oh, it works so well. And I, I also get to decide which giggles remain. Like, was this giggle actually a bit inappropriate? Well, was this giggle actually there's like one too many giggles and it feels like it sounds like I'm giggling too much oh yeah this is very bad for my normal speech in every day <laughs> this is horrific for it <laughs> but for it's, it's very useful for a podcast <laughs> very useful to edit all that stuff out uh, but anyway I had, I had my 30 minutes and dot 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 joke or plan as for you for you, you guys know it was my best one yet WWE don't deserve it this week I have got all of my notes written for Smackdown and Raw but I don't know if, if I'm going to talk about them at all I've instead I've got a I've got Bix's article, which he posted up for Rolling Stone, which came out last night. I was considering recording last night. Instead, I, I watched Bake Off, and then I, I had a lovely time uh, just, I just cleaning up after dinner and things. I come upstairs, play little video games, I turn off my video games, and I see that uh, two hours earlier was posted the article on Rolling Stone. I was like, oh, okay, right. Good thing I decided to do all of that instead of recording, because Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ. But, yeah, I don't know if I want to talk about the WWE shows at all. At what, after reading all this, I'm meant to just talk about the TV shows now. It just feels, with my headspace just isn't there. So I'm going to talk about this. Um, I don't know if I'm even going to do like that big of an edit on this and just kind of lead it relatively raw. Uh, like, if, if I misread stuff, it's not quite the same with me reading an article than it would be like a script where I'm trying to sound animated about the best thing what I did watch. When I go through an article like this, I feel like, well, mostly because I don't know if I'm going to want to go through <laughs> all this material again in, in an edit. This one, this is a tough one. The content here is going to is quite difficult. As like when we covered the Janelle Grant lawsuit, the the topics here are going to be discussed. Like if you don't want to go through all this stuff, don't listen to this episode. It's fine. It's fine. Come back next week. Hopefully, I'll be in a space to want to talk about Raw and SmackDown. But the, the, literally, the lawsuit dropped last night when I nearly recorded. So for me, it's really strange. Reg, right, just Reg, he uh, made a really good point on Blue Sky. Just that what we're meant to just go back and just watch the TV now and just talk about that. Like the news cycle is meant to just move on from this. Like, it's, it's a really weird part of the kind of vesting psyche that there's almost like a uh, kayfabing of this within the WWE world but by like certain sections of fans who just do want to just move on to the next thing. Like, it's so strange that like, the ability to just compartmentalise it and, and just be like, oh, okay, that's the thing that happened. Next. <laughs> like, wait, no. <laughs> How about we just take a second, just stay in place for a second. Let's actually just talk about this because Jesus Christ, this is not something where you just read it and go, oh, okay. Like Pete Davidson reaction. You don't, you don't have a reaction and then just move on to the next thing like consume media 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 consume but like, this isn't that this is something to actually just take a second to just be like no hold on hold on so again if you don't want to listen to this content um i guess if you somehow missed it and this has been just downloaded because you've got the social suplex stuff and you somehow missed it and i'm the first show talking about this uh, the lawsuit does contain stuff about child abuse and uh, i guess where's the phrase yeah grooming sexual uh, grooming and sexual abuse and stuff so it's very dark material so if you don't want to listen to that stuff tune out now i'll see you next week Right, so let's talk about Ring Boys. Right, Jesus Christ. This has come up before. 
in the eight, late eighties, early nineties, as far as I can tell, realizing with talent all over the place, which is dangerous for a topic like this to bring it back. But uh, David Bixby Batten, for as long as I've followed his work and his content, this is the type of thing where he saw type of person to see this and go, hold on a minute, and actually continue to do research into this, keep the story alive. Now here he is posting an article on Rolling Stone on quite a big outlet, and he's, he's got so much obtained knowledge about this stuff. My God, <laughs> like some of the things within this. Because last time with the Janelle Grant lawsuit, when I was talking about to, for this show, I did read the lawsuit and I tried to present what I could. But this time for my own mental health, I was like, yeah, I, I don't want to read this. <laughs> Instead, I've got like the articles of kind of the people that I trust. So yeah, so I guess the, the brief of it. On Wednesday of this week, five men who had worked as ring boys for World Wrestling Entertainment as young teenagers in the 1980s filed a lawsuit alleging that they were groomed and sexually abused by ring crew boss and ring announcer Mel Phillips on the company's watch. I don't know if I made it super clear. This is David Bixon's fan's article on Rolling Stone that's talking about this. Also, you can go with this. He's guested on certain talking uh, things as well. So if you, if you follow him on different medias, you'll see all the different appearances he's made since this has dropped. Since the lawsuit came out, since his article went up on Rolling Stone. But you can also think there's also the work with uh, John Pollock and Brendan Thurston over post wrestling. <laughs> there's a bit, some bit, there's multiple people doing really good work. I highly recommend you check all those out as well. And of course, our own Trish and Sarah, like they'll put themselves through hell <laughs> to make sure that this is covered accurately, covered well. I think I've said it before. They don't don't have enough praise to be on the same network as uh, two people as talented as them. So the suit names WWE parent company TKO Group Holdings and WWE co-founders. Uh, Co-founder slash former executives Vince and Linda McMahon as defendants. Mel Phillips, who is the accused abuser, died in 2012. And I've seen a lot of confusion being like, well, what's this got to do with TKO Group? With them inheriting WWE, they inherit this shit as well. In terms of like help the whole business world, it's like, oh, wait, like, oh, could TKO Group or could uh, Netflix actually go at Vince for not really uh, laying this out, saying this could be a potential issue? <laughs> it's like, ah, welcome to the business world. This was laid out as a potential issue. <laughs> this hasn't caught them by surprise. <laughs> so, uh, yep, business world sucks. The suit paints a picture of Phillips as someone to whom WWE gave unfettered access to kids and the means to abuse them, such as private locker rooms. The plaintiff's allegations are buoyed by evidence already in the public record, pointing to ongoing knowledge of the alleged abuse by those at the top of WWE, particularly the McMahons. While there are two previously known lawsuits by former Ring Boys alleging sexual assault against Phillips, this filing marks the first time that the McMahons have been named personally as defendants. It also directly ties Linda, the co-chair of Donald Trump's 2024 transition team, to the alleged cover-up of child sexual abuse. This, for wrestling fans, this isn't a new story. This was something that was relatively known. When it's told, it's somewhat within that bubble of the late 80s, 90s, with all the lawsuits and actions against Vince. And if you watch the Netflix documentary, it's talked about, but it's not. The true weight of how bad it was isn't felt in the documentary at all. I feel like it, like now's really not a bad time at all to be doing a lawsuit like this with the Netflix documentary. Having put the knowledge in people's head about this happening. And uh, the way, because it went into it into a little bit of detail. But it, <laughs> the lawsuit details, yeah, quite horrific stuff. So the uh, attorney on the case, uh, Greg Gutzler, how do you say it? Gutzler? Gutzler. I've got so three consonants in a row, my brain shut down. <laughs> Gutzler. So I'm uh, saying, thanks to the extraordinary courage of our clients, we now have the opportunity to hold accountable the WWE and its leaders for the past 40 plus years, Vince and Linda McMahon, who enabled the rampant abuse of these young boys. The WWE organisation and the McMahons had a higher duty to protect the ring boys, yet they failed in the most appalling way. The complaint details just some of the facts underlying this scheme of abuse. We are certain that there will be significant developments in the coming months that will illuminate even further the systemic corruption and abuse inside the WWE. We are committed to uncovering the truth behind this long-running insidious abuse, and we honour our clients' bravery by vowing to relentlessly pursue justice on their behalf. So this is where the kind of uh, some of the more outside things come in. Janelle Grant's attorney, she put out a statement yet again reiterating what had been said a month ago, urging for the NDAs to be lifted so that all these other people could come forward with their stories. And this is another one where that pressure can be applied again. It was, it, the pressure was applied when the Netflix thing came out on air, and at the end of it felt like every single episode there was a Vince settled this lawsuit here, or Vince settled that lawsuit there. At the end of every, every single ex episode there had to be an exclaimer. One of the most egregious ones is the Rita Chatterton case. Can't believe he said that comment at the end, where he's, he's denying it, and then just right at the end says, even if the like had happened, like the, the statute of limitations on rape of, uh, yeah, I wouldn't be able to do it, but nothing would have come of it. And then right at the end he has to say, yeah, they were temporarily lifted after me too, and uh, he had to pay a millions. So I was like, oh God. Jesus Christ, didn't they? We couldn't, look, couldn't have looked more guilty. And then the statement at the end being like, oh, for God's, oh Jesus Christ, <laughs> this man. 
But she, yes, uh, through the Janelle Grant case. So we said again after Netflix came out, they said again here with just that pr- a pressure seems to be applied more and more each time. Which brings us to Phil Mushnick, the other outside story related to... I do call it an outside story because he's so tied to what happened in the 90s and ongoing afterwards. Uh, I just loved his quote within <laughs> within the Netflix series. It was like, they think we've got something out of... Something for Vince, like, going after him. It's like, yeah, he's a piece of shit. <laughs> just like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's like, not at all hiding the stance. <laughs> I did quite like that. Also, it was edited to be a bit of a laugh, so, so yeah, the production crew knew what they had with him. But yeah, so uh, Phil Mushnick was somebody who reported on this way back in the day. And after seeing just how bad it was and what he was uncovering, he was somebody who was like, I can't let this go. Like, the, I have just friends who don't really watch what they're investing at all, but will see these news articles and things. Again, it's in the Rolling Stone. Like, this is a, this is a big outlet. And just ask me the question of, why would you, like, why do you watch this stuff? And uh, my reply is just, yep, yeah, like, the, yeah. Well, I mean, what helps about it is AEW. Like, I do have another company I can watch. So, like, today, the first thing I did when I had free time was watch AEW Dynamite. And I, I had an alright time. Part of that alright time is just because I was so down on wrestling when uh, this had dropped Wednesday night. But part of the WWE rhetoric has been that it's nowhere near as bad as Mushnick's been saying. He's just got a vendetta against Vince McMahon. None of this is as bad as he's painting it out to be in his articles and his writing. It's just him having a personal vendetta for whatever reason to go after Vince McMahon. Well, part of this uh, lawsuit, WWE had a tape of Mel Phillips abusing. Like, Jesus Christ. Them trying to put stuff, them to bury it and put stuff out there. Uh, Alfred Kanoa, Jesus Christ, my man. <laughs> this is why you don't just blindly accept stuff from a company. Like, almost like a, like, looking out for you, Alfred. This is why you question, because now you are visibly seen as trying to go after the guy who is writing a piece on this paedophile stuff. Like, you are defending a company who's trying to hide paedophilia now. Like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> This is why you question why they're asking for you to do it. <laughs> this is why you question it. Uh, now you're tied to it. So not that his reputation wasn't already tarnished, but now Jesus Christ, <laughs> it was already in the bin. But now there's a whole heap of shit on top of it. Like <laughs> you're not getting at Jesus Christ. Just ask a question. Just don't blindly take. Just don't blindly do it. But in line with that statement, Jessica Rosenberg, who's an attorney for Vince McMahon, said, uh, More than 30 years ago, the economist Phil Mushnick tried to make headlines with these same false claims. Those allegations were never proven and ultimately became the subject of a defamation lawsuit against Mr. Mushnick, which went nowhere. The negligence claims against Mr. McMahon that were asserted today rely on these same absurd defamatory and utterly meritless statements by Mr. Mushnick. We will vigorously defend Mr. McMahon and are confident the court will find that these claims are untrue and unfounded. So kind of just a similar similar quote that you can uh, expect from this. Also hitting on the fact that it's uh, via the, Mr. Mushnick when there's now five ring boys staying anonymous who are telling their personal experiences. It's not a great defence, really, uh, to say, oh, it's just the same defamatory stuff from back then, da da da. Like, uh, no, got video. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ. The foregoing admissions and accounts establish not only that defendants knew or should have known about Philip's sexual harassment and abuse of the Ring Boys, but the defendants failed to protect the Ring Boys and knowingly fostered and allowed a culture of sexual misconduct to permeate the WWE. What? It feels. It was weird to be critiquing the to, the Vince McMahon attorney statement, but just just to fall back on the film watching stuff, where it's like the actual details within there go far past just what what, what he was writing about. This is uh, this is pretty bad. And then we've got the history of uh, Mel Phillips as well. As uh, was hinted earlier on in the article, that publicly uh, this was known with Mel Phillips. Like this wasn't just a sudden revelation. Oh, oh, partly down to the amazing work by by, by film watching it. Things like wrestling fans are like, no, just like the story of after he fired, after the scandal broke out, Vince fired him, Pat Patterson and Terry, uh, I've forgotten which Terry it was. But yeah, he fired those three people, gradually over time hired them back, uh, with the Mel Phillips agreement being, only if you promise not to do it again. He did it again. So, yeah, but this is crazy just on a verbal agreement, <laughs> just to say something like that. that. Like, that is, like, not protecting your, not, not, not protecting these boys, like, in any form or any manner. It's absolutely horrific. But this is through the Tom Cole stuff, when that was coming out and he was speaking about it. Uh, Tom Cole and Chris Loss were the two ring boys who had uh, talked previously. It was the uh, San Diego Union Tribune reported. But outside of, uh, like, wrestling-centric fancies, the story was largely ignored by major media outlets, which has kind of been par for the course. It's like, ah, wrestling's this weird place where stuff happens and you don't really take it seriously or you don't take reporting on it seriously. It has, it has got a point, point to a fan. 
where whenever like mentioned anything within wrestling, you just you just sense this. Oh, that that silly place. Da, da, da. It's like wait wait wait. Don't stop listening now because I've said the word wrestling. Like please seriously, <laughs> this if this is a world it's happening in, but the story has absolutely nothing to do with this, with it being wrestling. It just happens to be in the shadow of a wrestling business being run. But no no no, this is about child abuse, which is like obviously way more important. At the time, Vincent Mann told the media that he had long suspected children were not safe around Phillips. Those comments came in the larger context of a reckoning about the prevalence of antibiotic steroid abuse by the WWE roster, as well as allegations of sexual harassment against Phillips direct supervisor Terry Garvin, Pat Patterson. Another quote from the article, like, it was routine for WWE announcers to joke on television about wrestlers having attended the Terry Garvin School of Self-Defense. Yet WWE's habit of going scorched earth with legal threats and other interference, as documented by the likes of The Village Voice and Pro Wrestling Newsletter 3 Count, seemingly scared off national legacy media from covering the Ring Boy scandal. And massive shout out to Bix for this, who has just constantly been covering this stuff and keeping it in the limelight. But for me, like this, yes, we love the wrestling world, but it doesn't mean we have to be blind to anything bad happening. Like, I don't want to live in a world where the thing gets made, and who cares about how people are treated in the making of the thing? All that happens is all that all that all, that, all I care about is thing happen. Hey, thing happen, me happy. Like, no, no, I, I can't be thing happen, me happy if the people are being abused within the environment of the thing we made. Like, no, but I do highly recommend reading the like, entire article. Bix goes into more detail about his coverage and with what I was talking about earlier where he's been covering this for a while so he does talk about all of his other work that he has been doing and all the different things he's posted so if you go to this article you will be able to just pretty much find it all. You will get all of the kind of like wider context of the information of all the stuff he's covered as well. But previously the only ring boy known to uh, initiate legal action was Tom Cole. Now this is something entirely different. Five of them staying anonymous named John Doe's in the lawsuit detailing the abuse here within it, blaming uh, Linda McMahon and Vince McMahon for covering it up, for WWE obviously, and TKO being that they're the body that bought them. Uh, yeah, and also don't want to talk about professional wrestling under the uh, under the chips era when this has happened, and this is the shadow like over the top of it. Don't want to do it. Same when the Janelle Grant lawsuit came out, where part of me was like, do I have to read this horrific lawsuit, or do I just do a bit at the start and then talk about the wrestling? And sometimes I feel like they're too big where my brain's just like, ah, don't really want to just talk about the best thing as if it's normal and uh, that's, that's why I quoted Reg at the start for me that's, that's kind of outlining how this show is going to go where I was just like ah, I don't want to <laughs> I really just don't want want to uh, talk about it at the start and be like yeah this is bad but tune into these other places I do still recommend you tune into those other places like my runtime isn't super long here I'm, and I'm not going in full detail the main thing read, read the article of the Rolling Stones the lawsuit's out there if you want to but also there's the coverage on the post wrestling stuff of the amazing work being done elsewhere I didn't want to just mention it at the start and then move on. I felt like, no, dedicating an entire episode to just kind of talking about it and just living in this, in the bubble of it just for a little bit, just to highlight, no, this is, this is, this is important. I don't want to move on, just move on from it. So this is where we get to the John Doe speaking out. When I said earlier, like, if you don't want to, like, listen to dark stuff, then tune out now. I was like, now I'm saying, if you really don't want to, tune out now. Uh, you've got kind of, like, the overview of it, but this is the... Uh, this is the actual, like the meat of the potatoes. So one little thing of note is some of the abuse detailed is within the time frame of before Vince bought WWE for so the early 80s when it was still Vince Senior. All five describe the abuse beginning with Phillips, targeting them as wrestling fans he met at or around the shows or in social situations uh, in his home in Philadelphia. John Doe 1 was a 13-year-old in 81-82 and describes the grooming process that began with Phillips, giving him access to an area and a locker room area, including a private room over which Phillips had control, alleging that Phillips uh, groping his genitals and uh, like laughing it off or whatever. Then a few weeks later, Phillips stripping down to his underwear in his hotel room and wrestling and kind of like suffocating him, but on the wrestling moves, which is the start of the cycle of abuse. The next time he saw Phillips was in Massachusetts. Phillips introduced him and two other boys to various wrestlers before bringing them to a private room. John Doe 1 realising Phillips is aroused. Later alleging Phillips drove John Doe 1 and the second boy from Springfield to Philadelphia and again was, I'll say the word inappropriate. He includes a particularly lengthy and detailed narrative of the abuse. I don't, th- I don't think I need to go through like every single little detail, but I feel like that kind of, that starts to really paint a picture of what we're talking about here. Building up to the plaintiff alleging that Phillips tried to rape him and several other boys in a hotel room. 
being like that was the thing that scared him enough to cut off contact. John Doe 2 said there wasn't the same level of effort to groom him. It was more just almost like straight up just asking him if he wanted to go to the following means to addressing him and just immediately just going for it. Then alleging that jo- that he uh, continued with similar abuse in other Helto rooms, private arena locker rooms, as I described earlier. The And the important part, recording the abuse on his video camera, which I briefly mentioned earlier. It's like, no, when WWE were trying to play down this, it'd be like, it's not as bad as it sounds. They had video evidence. I'm realising pretty strongly that I'm going to have to edit this because there's so many pauses as I'm being like, nope, don't want to read that out loud. With John Doe 2 saying that he witnessed Phillips similarly abusing other young boys, alleging that Phillips took photos and videos of the abuse. John Doe 3 met Phillips in the early 80s, uh, talking to the kids as if like, do you like wrestling? And helped him meet, meet a couple of the wrestlers, again wrestling the kids to the ground and uh, so on and so on. Here, the plaintiff alleges that Phillips would sometimes give him soda that tasted different than normal soda and caused him to become lightheaded, all as a pretext to further sexual abuse. Again, stating that Phillips shot photographs and videos of the abuse. Oh, some, when I said it earlier, somehow I completely missed it. The also is actually, Bix has put it in the Bonnie Stones article, so good on you, Bix. <laughs> good on you there. I just I somehow completely forgot. I was like, no, it's out there. So it's legit here. Just, it's just, everything you could need is uh, here in the article. John Doe 4 is between 1983 and 1985. A confidential witness cited in the complaint, uh, described as a sibling of one of the Doe 4's friends, echoes the allegations in an interview with uh, the Rolling Stone. Recording that on multiple occasions, she witnessed how Phillips would drive onto the street, watch the boys play, and show them all the WWE Championship belts he kept in his car. And the boys would somehow, sometimes return drunk. According to the complaint, Phillips uh, served the boys alcohol at a motel. And again, more abuse ensuing. John Doe 5 also between 83 and 84. Again, alleging that Phillips filled them with alcohol. And again, alleging with the wrestling complaint embedding a photograph that Doe 5 took of two of his friends in one of the hotel rooms they shared with Phillips where one of the boys appears to have stripped down to his underwear and with a beer can visible in the background. And this is all in the shadow of the sexual allegations of Vince McMahon with the multiple payouts, with the uh, Janelle Grant stuff, with the Netflix documentary coming out bringing it all back into the consciousness again for anyone who, who consumed media thing and then moved on. It's like there's a reason that I gave two notifications for it's gonna get dark where at the start I was like, just even mentioning this stuff is pretty bad. Uh, for the second one, I was like, no, seriously, leave now. <laughs> Stop listening, it's fine. And there was some stuff I didn't read out. I, f- I felt like, I, don't, I didn't feel like I wanted to really read out in detail fully everything. If you are, if you do want to just fully read everything, the lawsuit is in the Rolling Stones article. I've skipped quite a bit of podcasts, because I'm not really talking about everything. Uh, but yeah, quite a... I don't really know how to sign off or whether to go into like uh, the background and stuff, but... Um, I don't want to just read all of Bix's article to you. <laughs> well, that's a bit uh, quoted enough of it. I don't really want to. I feel like I wanted, I wanted to go through it like, in detail. I don't really think I've got. It. I don't want to spend like another ten minutes like adding to stuff. Don't really know how to sign it off either. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Maybe just talking like this just a little bit. Uh, you can feel it in my voice. You can feel it in the way I kind of projecting myself as like, yeah, this is not something I want to move on from. I want to spend. I want to actually, you know, dedicate important time to this. Uh, but yeah, go, if you are, if you do want to have people who've been doing the research into this, Bix has been all over media stuff. Go to his Blue Sky or go to his Twitter, and it will all be there. And again, post wrestling have done something great as well. If you go over to them too, so, yes, Parkinson Thurston have done a full video where diving into this as well. Uh, so yeah, Pff, do I end it now? <laughs> oh, I kind of don't want to like just. I find trying to. Uh, there's a bit a comedian does where it's just trying to find the way out of the bit, um, just find a way out of the segment. And when it's a pregnant pause, it's like. Oh, that was a good one. I could have, I could have got out there. <laughs> well, I could, I could have stopped at that point. Anyway, um, I feel like the the way that I've kind of talked about it within this has gotten across just my attitudes towards this. Like, don't want to talk about WWE. Wanted to dedicate all the attention to this. Went through the article, but didn't want. Didn't. I don't have too much to add because like, I'm not somebody who's researched all of this or whatever. That will come with people with time. It's why I. Um, I have so much praise for Trish and Sarah. The amount of research and time that they put into making sure they're getting it right. Um, obviously, it's very, very stressful <laughs> to, it, to put that pressure on yourself, but um, I, ca- I can't commend them enough for making making sure they're doing that. And again, the same with Bix, same with uh, Pollock and Thurston. The amount of time and effort they put into making sure they're getting it right. Is it, yeah, it's about it's not about being first, it's about being right. Uh, but yeah, anyway, I don't really want to end with like a question or anything. I don't really want to end with plugging too much stuff. I got the plugs away out at the start or on purpose. I made sure I got the drop tease thing out at the start on purpose because I didn't want to be plugging stuff at the end of the show because it didn't feel appropriate. But yes, yeah, I've given you more recommendations if you want to go into stuff, if you're still around at this point. We'll see how long this comes out as because the time of my recording is actually pretty long. 
However, there are so many pauses as I'm being like, yep, don't want to read that out. Or I start reading a bit and I'm like, no, no. But anyway, I'll be back this time next week. I'm going to say talking about Smackdown and Raw. Um, we'll see where I'm at mentally this time next week. Well, this time next week, well, I've consumed media and be ready for more media. <laughs> There's a, just a... Not, 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 to, not to dive too deep on <laughs> social workings. Anyway, with that... Oh, I, I thank you for engaging uh, in any form, any manner. Always appreciate it, never take it for granted. Uh, everybody at Social Suplex, I appreciate every single one of you, be it you in the Discord or just interacting with us on the social medias, on the Twitters, on the Blue Skies, or YouTube comments, whatever. Um, always appreciate it, never take it for granted. I, mu- I will be back this time next week to talk about Smackdown and Raw, question mark, he says. <laughs> Not entirely sure. Anyway, with that, I bid you adieu. Adios. <laughs>